I got a lot of stick that one time and insinuated the heavy wasn't the brightest spark, with half the comments section reminding me that he does, in fact, canonically have a higher level of education than I do. But I'd like to remind all of those commenters that everything's relative in the world of TF2, and compared to the engineer's 11 hard science PhDs, he is a dunce. Transporting Team Fortress's Del Conniger, one of the smartest, most innovative mercenaries around, into the world of Payday 2 isn't the easiest task, especially when I once described Sentry gameplay in this game as being akin to switching one's brain off. Alas, today I'll be trying to merge genius strategy with the art of hiding behind a deadly bullet-firing hunk of metal as we find out if you can beat Payday 2 as the engineer. Starting as we always do with the rules, I just first want to remember the one and only Mitten Squad, who the world sadly lost earlier in December. Paul was a massive inspiration for many a YouTube challenge runner, popularising the format myself and others use within Fallout and the Elder Scrolls series, helping to shape a style of creation that now runs deep within my channel. It's quite a legacy that I'm proud to carry forward with videos like today's. That said, here are Engineer's stipulations. I know you guys hated that I limited the pyro run to fire damage, so we won't just be using sentries to deal damage on this one. Instead, they'll just be a key option in my arsenal, as I'm also allowed to use one specific pistol, the Gruber Kurs, the TF2 Shotgun, which is a mod found in the description below, and the Monkey Wrench melee weapon. All utility tools and equipment such as the Saw and C4 will also be fair game for this run. I will however be limited to how I'm allowed to approach stealth. When actually attempting to sneak attack guards, I will not be able to damage them normally, instead having to use the Silent Sentry for a takedown. This does actually work, but is pretty finicky, so will be a nice curveball to make stealth that bit more challenging and encourage me to tackle most heists the hard way using more gun. Following our usual format for Payday 2, we'll be starting out at level 0, Infamy 0, and will not be grinding for money or experience outside of the usual flow of career mode. All heists must be played solo and offline, which is actually possible in this game, crazy, I know. Cray AI will be allowed for stealth heists but cannot be turned on in loud gameplay, mods will be kept to a minimum outside of those necessary for the run, meaning I will still be using Vanilla HUD Plus, alongside a small subsection of TF2 specific mods. Lastly, we play all heists on the highest available career mode difficulty, capping at Deathwish, meaning mayhem up to level 80 and Deathwish from then onwards. I've decided to drop lifelines from this run altogether, they just haven't been that necessary in recent runs, and with the many tools at NG's disposal, if I can't find a solution to a heist within the base rule set, I don't think I deserve any lifelines. Whilst I might have missed my Christmas deadline for this video, let's see if I can't get you a face full of festive Payday 2 challenge running joy before the year is through. Yelwonk is back over this Christmas period, and has been given the equivalent of a fat lump of coal immediately upon loading up the game. Apparently, all my progress as the sniper in the last run has been corrupted, forcing me to start all over again with a completely fresh account. Not a huge issue, just save the pain of clicking that reset button, but still a little bit ominous. I should mention at this point that I've purchased the infamous collection for this Steam account since the last run, meaning Yelwonk is dripped out to the max now. Playing as Dallas, the closest thing to a Texan Payday 2 will ever see, keep those hands visible and all that, sporting a pair of overalls and a hard hat on one set and a Wild West look with a Texan flag cowboy hat to boot for any stealth runs. Speaking of stealth, that is usually the best way to get a challenge like this one underway. Seeing Murky Station, the heist that just got added to Payday 3, I thought I'd have an advantage on this one as I settled back into Payday 2 after three months of nothing but its sequel. Unfortunately, these two games do stealth quite differently, and it just so happens that you can't get away with quite as much, especially in front of those fixed Titan cameras. Murky Station has to be completed as a pure pacifist here, remember, as only the sentry can be used to pick up stealth kills, and right now, it's impossible to silence the one we currently have. Attempt 2 started much better though, as I finessed my way around the train carts and down into the basement. With all the heist tools in hand, I was able to pick up the first half of the bomb, at which point I realised that switching back to G to throw might be a bit of a problem. Playing around with my settings, I decided 10 years of ingrained bad habits were probably easier to relearn than 3 months of good, so I instead stumbled over to the second EMP part and eventually secured it the old fashioned way without seeing another murky water guard. With an initial 28 levels now under my belt, I was well positioned to put my first build together. I started with the perk deck, grabbing Grinder for the first time in this series. Whilst its initial perks healing isn't game changing, by the time we reach a fully unlocked deck we'll have the strongest innate healing build possible, which actually synergizes with sentry guns as they can also activate the regen effect. I had the cash to purchase both the TF2 shotgun and Gruber Kurs, modifying both with the XP booster to secure those perk points as soon as possible, as Grinder really isn't great early on. 
I also turned my stock shotgun into the Frontier Justice, probably the best weapon in the entire shotgun mod, and added a few Christmas lights to celebrate the season. The build was fairly generic early on, with the usual Joker to take the heat off me, and a few sentry skills so that it could actually defend itself via the shield, and didn't blast through all its ammo in seconds by switching over to the AP rounds. This was all the setup I needed to head into this run's first narrative heist, the classic jewelry store. Knowing I needed to drill into the rear office safe, I set up the drill there first, hoping to spend as short a time as possible in the loud assault portion, with just two perk points basically keeping me afloat. This was going great until I remembered that Gumbutts actually deal damage in Payday 2, giving this poor Civ the old Texas two-step completely unintentionally. After reaching fines for that assault, I rushed about my business, starting to secure as many bags in stealth as possible, but having cops called on me right as the safe opened up. This meant I had to hold down the store whilst the escape van circled the area, stretching this first responder out across the pavement as a display of dominance. In truth though, I wasn't really that dominant as I held off the cops at the front of the building, but remembered all my mechanics backwards. Trying to slide about, I was just crouching everywhere, which eventually got me caught out in the manager's office when a taser zapped me in place and a SWAT unit smacked me back down. Things didn't go much better on attempt two, as I thoughtlessly broke stealth immediately, forcing me into a war of attrition from the get-go that I eventually lost, as I once again forgot just how hard cop melee attacks used to hit. I honestly had high hopes that the heavy caliber tripod mounted little old sentry gun would hard carry this run, but here we are, failing jewelry store for the third time in a row, this time due to pure stupidity as I failed to notice just how weak Grinder's initial health regeneration effect actually is. On attempt 4, I pulled myself together at last, taking down my first dozer of the run thanks to the sentry's immensely powerful shield taking up every shot for me, allowing me to reposition the bags into this side alleyway where my automatic gun could cover the final securing runs, keeping the focus off me as I slid bags 7 and 8 into the van for escape. With the money I'd earned from that hit, I invested in a pair of vault door keys over on the following bank heist. It took a couple of minutes before my thermal lance was even being contested, but when it finally was, the culprits were a group of dangerous dozers who could instantly put an end to most runs this early on. Switching over to the Rescue Ranger was a mistake, as this thing is far too inaccurate to be a slug weapon and sadly doesn't function as intended in TF2, but my sentry itself more than made up for my lack of DPS, easily holding down the attention of both dozers and cutting through any shields that might appear as a roadblock with its armor-piercing abilities. One thing I did notice on this house though, is that grabbing jokers in Payday 2 seems to have changed slightly as of those recent inexplicable updates. Heavy SWAT seem to take a lot more convincing before they'll turn, which does surprise me, but might be a strange attempt to balance joker skills, which is a little too late in my opinion. It was certainly too late to stop this bank heist as I picked up a single bag of cash from the vault, grabbed a joker for insurance and sprinted over to the escape without any issues. That's more like it, but brings us on to our first potential stealth heist. I've always found the diamond store to be easier in stealth, hence why I've put together somewhat of a stealth build for our first attempt at silent sentrying, a technique I've actually never tried before in three and a half thousand hours of this game. That probably goes without saying, as who the hell is bringing a sentry gun to a knife fight, but run one did start promisingly. I took down cams with pure intimidation before finding the manager on our own to switch off the alarms. After controlling another guard upstairs, disaster struck as my sentry shot the inquiring officer after he was alerted, rolling the 10% chance for him to fire his weapon upon death, alerting the entire heist via a classic chain reaction. Still, this was clearly possible. I just needed a bit of luck, which I didn't get on run 2 when my sentry fired second against this startled camera guard. Trying this again, two more times versus the guard in this tiny side room, it seemed there was a clear flaw to my approach. When a guard is already alerted, it's possible for the sentry gun to fire instantly, dropping men before they can fire back. But it will never fire on a passive target, meaning if a guard expressly spots it first, they will become hostile and fire instantly, not giving the sentry time to respond. After finding the side door missing on the next attempt, and then running into the same issue with the downstairs security once more, I decide to default back to my initial strategy, dominating the passive guard on cams, before moving upstairs. There I was surprised by a pair of guards right before the first door, but after dominating both of them on the upper floor, I was able to set up my silent sentry covering them, which dispatched the final guard on the heist completely out of view of the civilians. Perfect heist control in the least practical way possible. Fearful of having to mess around with this micromagy style of stealth again if a Civ phoned the cops, I smacked down most who I didn't have the cable ties to deal with, admittedly with my gun butt, but that isn't entirely significant when they aren't combatants. Even so, it doesn't sit quite right with me, I should really be showing them the kind of sudden hospitality they deserve, so we'll be going on a monkey wrench unlocking mission right after this heist. 
In any case, the gunbutt murder was the right play as I was able to secure all 14 required bags of diamonds without another incident. As I just mentioned, to unlock my usable melee weapon for this run, I needed to earn a rather strange achievement. Heavy Metal is a Shacklethorn auction achievement, which needs you to walk a fellow engineer through the metal detectors at the start of the heist. Easy, right? Until you remember that it needs to be done in stealth or the detectors will already be down. Not my favourite 5 minutes I spent playing this game, as damn, moving sieves in Payday 2 is like watching paint dry, except that paint inexplicably stops drying once every 5 seconds without any reason or warning. Payday 2 might still be the superior overall experience right now, but goddamn, body shields are sorely missed. Anyway, after that misery, I tried again, this time with a few ECMs to cover my slow and jittery march across the old mansion, securing one of the game's only stealable weapons in the form of the Monkey Wrench, deputising the poor previous owner straight after for being all hard hat and no cattle. There's only room for one NG on this team. With that, Go Bank becomes the first seasonal battleground upon which to flex my new melee weapon. This thing has decent knockdown, which can be useful for challenges like this. GoBank also isn't the threat it sometimes can be on a run like this one, with sentries to cover the drill and a few methods of dealing with snipers. I did spend a couple of minutes lot picking deposit boxes, but once I had my hands on the cash, this heist was all but done. Until this single cloaker managed to smack me on three separate occasions, close enough together that it devastated my entire health bar and took me down before I could call in Pilot Listo for the escape. I'd like to say that Attempt 2 was more of the same, but things got a little freaky with this one. This dozer decided that vault doors meant nothing to him, phasing through them before flanking me in my gun and trapping me in a corner. Fortunately, my wimpy Gruber had just enough damage to drop in before I went down, giving me a new lease of life. On my way over to set up the loot cage, I spotted this SWAT lounging on the job, only for his uncanny ragdoll to be topped by another a few seconds later when the drill finished, leaving this SWAT in a perpetual state of demonic possession. God, I miss Diesel's complete disrespect for Isaac Newton. With the vault now open to mere mortals too, I was able to start lockpicking once more as I still wasn't willing to bring along the saw while snipers remained an issue, which ended up being a decision that nearly punished me as this Skulldozer was medic revived at the worst possible moment inside the revolt. Fortunately, choosing to place all his attention on the sentry long enough for me to take him down personally, surviving the messy encounter by the skin of my rawhide boots, finally unlocking a money filled bag and fleeing down to the sewers for the first underground escape of the run. Two base armor transports follow on next as Bane starts running out of original jobs. Finally, I took the plunge, switching over to the saw to massively speed up the lot picking, heading into Transport Park. This heist was absolutely terrorized by a set of dozers and a bunch of strangely floating swats. Eventually, they proved enough of a distraction for both dozers to run right up on me and my slowly growing sentry nest of two at this point, threading the needle between their shields and putting me down faster than I could react. I tidied up my sentry placements on attempt 2, using them to hold the cops at bay instead of getting into a close quarter scuffle with them, easily carrying all 5 bags of cash to Twitch at the escape. Sadly, it was a case of deja vu on my second heist at the dockyard, as after a promising start I was too stubborn to let go of an interaction, face tanking the unbelievably powerful Skulldozer at this stage, who left me low enough for a single shield to finish off. But again, attempt 2 was simple as I learned from my mistakes, moving the cash as early as possible away from the genset vans and over to the docks themselves for a relaxed escape by boat. Sadly, these two were just a warm up for the transport train heist which comes next, a nightmarishly fiddly scenario that had me absolutely gagging for Payday 3's new transporter skill line to be added retroactively to Payday 2. For this early into a run, the scope of this heist is always daunting, however for once I have 3 heisters worth of firepower from the outset. Also, there was a real Eureka effect when I realised that I'd been using my weapons all wrong when it came to dealing with snipers. In practice, the Gruber was a better dozer DPS option once the faceplate was missing, and the Frontier Justice was surprisingly ideal up against snipers, comfortably cross-mapping the pesky sods and sending them 6 feet down under. As we know from recent challenges over the past year, marshals are a huge curveball for all runs now, and that's no different here even with extra armour penetration with the turrets. However, I have got a whole lot better at actually using their weaknesses against them, turning this one's flashbanging shield against himself to continue drilling into the final vault carriage to reunite with a familiar friend. The level 1 sentry is possibly the most thematic loot any challenge run has ever seen. The sentry parts weren't the problem with this heist though, it was moving 20 total bags of ammunition across the entire heist that I was dreading. With only two sentries available in my current build, it was impossible to keep them all covered, resulting in the SWATs making it much harder than it had to be, carrying the, all the loose supply back over to the other side of the map. In the process of recovering the goods, I was absolutely nailed by snipers from all sides, just about able to take cover behind this tree long enough to stay alive. 
Slowly, my sentries started to bring me back to the land of the living with Grinder, allowing me to start moving the final bags via zipline once more. Bag ziplines were another mechanic that have had a serious glow up in Payday 3, as this one at the time crap is barely faster than just chucking the rounds of explosive ammunition manually. But even so, my bill was able to keep me alive long enough on Mayhem to secure the final bag and complete one of the lengthiest heists ever in this series, clocking in at a painstaking 37 minutes. At least it pays well, as we move into Vlad's assortment of heists with a fairly substantial and complete build. All I needed now was a few more sentries in my back pocket to play the game for me. You see, as I moved on to more Crasher, it became clear that so long as I could build and hide within a sentry nest, I was safe. But if I went on a solo mission with both of my guns already deployed, I was more fragile than I've ever been in any run I've attempted. Case in point, I found myself completely boxed into the clothing store with no way to actually deal with shield units, eventually finding myself trapped in a corner, tased, and taken down by the surprisingly damaging shield pistols on this difficulty. A similar downfall was nearly created for me on attempt 2 when I got stuck on some sort of invisible geometry attempting to flee from a schooldozer, somehow managing to wrangle my way out of there without him tearing me a structurally superfluous new behind, returning to my first ever multi-century nest inside the car dealership to hold out the final moments of this heist. Four stores is a nice change of pace as I switched up my build to incorporate a few shape charges to speed things up. RNG dictated that they couldn't quite get the job done on their own, but after a bit of scrounging I was already set up to flee the heist. Before doing so, developing a new sentry tech, where I'd switch it to fully auto to break through doses and their faceplates even faster, securing another quick and easy clear. The escape that followed after was also no big deal, bearing in mind I didn't even have any loot bags I needed to look after. Weiss Xmas is another simple Vlad heist, although I've noticed that my sentries aren't a massive fan of Almir Listo, I mean, uh, Harudin. I guess the poor guys must have just noticed the trifecta loot bag DLC get listed on Steam. Anyway, when they weren't staring at the skull of our literal ally in this heist, they were easily clearing the ways of oncoming responders, allowing me to escape the heist shortly after I got Elmir out of there. Moving on to Ukrainian job, I went for another sentry stealth run, jumping directly into this side room to dominate a guard whilst his mate was so surprised at my hubris I was able to build an entire level 2 sentry to take him down too and answer that second pager in time. From there, this heist is just a drill waiting simulator, grabbing the tiara and heading into the dreaded meltdown. This one's been a bit of a Widowmaker before, with awkward driving sections and nasty sniper spawns turning it into a bit of an RNG fest. Worried about those snipers, I maxed out my grouper's accuracy to at least stand a chance of landing those cross-map shots. Unfortunately, attempt one collapsed under the weight of a Scaldozer, who was just slightly too agile for me to run over in a clunky forklift, taking me down single-handedly right after opening up the warheads. On attempt 2, I rolled the indoor spawn for the nuke, smashing to load up all eight of my forklift in peace this time, before slowly plodding out to the sniper-covered yard. The ensuing snipe-off was fairly dangerous, but once I proved I was a true gunslinger over range with a few Gruber hotshots, I had the space I needed to hop into Longfellow and race to the escape train. Driving back up for the second set of warheads, the spawns were already making things much harder than they were before, although at this point, marshals were becoming more of a burden on the SWATs than they were a boon, as I made this one short circuit at just the right moment to interrupt and demolish his taser friend. After my sentries had cheesed me to the drive-by achievement by picking up kills whilst I drove, I was all loaded up and ready to outrun the SWAT van turrets once more, speeding to the exit with the final bags of nuclear loot in tow for a solid second time completion. Aftershock can be a tricky prospect following on from Meltdown and posing similar problems. Not problems like, what is beauty, because that would fall within the purview of your conundrums of philosophy, and to be quite frank, both heists look like shit. No, this heist presents practical problems to solve, like why is driving in Payday 2 so clunky and can my truck not get stuck on every single piece of geometry in this heist? Whilst I'm not sure I'm able to solve all of these, at the very least I now have an army of six sentries to protect me at all times, so even when things get a little sketchy, I have them looking out for me. After trawling the truck back up to the pickup zone, I was able to set up the sentry nest to end all nests, with six guns all trained up upon the single entrance to this strange empty building. Unsurprisingly, the cops didn't get far in here, continuously running into a brick wall of lead, until Bar rocked up and I could escape into the sky but with this marshal landing the last laugh by dealing permanent retinal damage on the liftoff. Still blinded by the brilliance of the sentry stats, I wandered straight into stealing Xmas and had my ass handed to me by a few beat cops. Not an ideal start, but by switching my wrench for a pistol, I avoided an immediate repeat on the next run. As ever on this heist, I brought an extensive set of tools to speed it up, soaring into the back office of the shoe store and finding the most laid-back sieve on the premises in the process. Already, that was this heist all but complete, securing my 378th Gruber kill blowing the roof sky high before escaping with the Christmas tree. 
Nightclub is next. Usually a heist I skip through as quickly as possible, given that it's boring as hell, but sadly attempt one was eventful for once, with a dozer dropping me through the cover of Flashbang early on. Frustratingly, run 2 was also cut short when this Skulldozer entered rage mode and ran through both my sentry gun and my health pool almost instantly. This is the first sentry death on the run, a statement of my failure as an engineer. As is so often the case with Nightclub though, once I just sat up and sat still for roughly 10 minutes of boredom, this wasn't easy clear, although it extended my torment by sending me to another escape scenario. Whilst these are a pain in Payday 2, I really wonder if they can be successfully reimagined in Payday 3 to give it that depth of heisting fantasy it really is missing at the moment. Anyway, with a great escape location, I was able to secure all bags once again and move on to Hector's multi-day jobs, another launch Payday 2 mechanic that has fallen by the wayside over the years. Continuing this trend of failing the easiest heist in the game, I managed to get myself shield blocked on my way up to secure the coke on watchdogs, dropping without even placing another sentry to defend myself. Attempt 2 also ended early, although I at least partially blame the rescue ranger for being terrible for this one. After another Skulldozer landed, they shot straight through my sentry and took me down. I swear these guys have upped their spawn intensity on Mayhem, and it's doing me no favours at all. Setting up on Attempt 3, I created the best little slaughterhouse in Texas inside the van, giving the wave of responders a nasty surprise as they opened it up. This time around, I just played things safe, rushing straight over to the armoured car as soon as it was in place to flee directly onto Day 2. Switching back over to the vastly superior Frontier Justice, this day was complete domination, fleeing without an incident in just over 6 minutes. Firestarter now, another heist that has me begging for transporter as I lug each individual bag up the hill to the escape. At least my sentries provide great cover, meaning I really can just concentrate on completing the objectives. Moving on to day 2, I set up my full suite of sentries up by the servers, realising I made a bit of a mistake with no ammo drops and my sword dictating whether I could drop any more sentries in the future. To make up for this deficiency, I tried going full TF2 mode and whacking my sentry with a wrench. Someone please make a mod where I can refill and heal my gun by doing this. My NG immersion would absolutely peak. On the way over to the escape van with the server, I ran into a couple of tricky dozers who just couldn't quite land a shot between my activations of Bullseye, meaning I made it back for the second server, securing it to complete this day. Day 3 was a walk in the park as it took too long for the cops to even start challenging me inside the bank, at which point it was already too late. I had a complete vice grip on the building with my sentries, meaning I could just rancho relaxo whilst I recorded the burning, escaping after around 8.5 minutes. With the extra skill points I earned here, I added high value target for 15% additional sentry damage on marked specials and bloodthirst, thinking it would buff my wrench damage to the point of viability. I wasn't able to test these new additions out on attempt 1 of rats, as those Mendozas can really mess you up if you're not paying attention. But attempt 2 was also not the best. I learned on this heist that neither of my new skill additions really work in my current build, as sentries don't stack up kills for the bloodthirst multiplier, and marking cops for high value target just tends to result in switching off my sentries AP rounds. Not exactly ideal. Even less ideal was how this heist ended, after a pair of tasers got their claws into me simultaneously, holding me in place for their friends to bring down. Special units in Payday 2 just hit different, man. And you know what else hits different in Payday 2? The incredible atmosphere of the cook-off heist. Payday 3 is a much better looking game, but man, there's just something about Payday 2's dark, smoky aesthetic that resonates with me. Taking in the atmosphere instead of risking the great outdoors on run 3, I just held down the upper floor of the lab with my sentries, going virtually AFK for sections of the heist for that authentic NG experience. After escaping with 3 bags of meth to complete the day 2 trade without a hitch, I then took down the Mendoza bus out of the city, finishing off Hector's final job in the series. The elephant enters the picture next via Big Oil. Day 1 is always quite easy with ECM jammers to stop the cameras from spotting the assault on the biker HQ, although they do have the firepower to drop me through my still underpowered grinder build at this stage. Attempt 2 was much cleaner though, finding the address in the first safe I drilled. Day 2 was another triumph for this pseudo stealth sentry playstyle that I'm developing, as I dominated the first guard and immediately located the security system override thanks to ECM overdrive. Incredibly, the hogtied cop out front was the perfect bait for my sentry gun, chopping down all the guards who happened to notice something off, whilst also breaking the Geneva Convention by taking out the dominated guard himself. I'm not sure about the ethics of all of this, but I'm not taking the blame, and what I am sure of is that the sentry bought me more than enough time to gain access to the lab and call in bile before the alarm was sounded. A pair of silent sentry turrets were more than enough to defend my position whilst the lab tested the fusion reactor, allowing me to flee this one safely even with almost a pure stealth build. This is a legit hybrid playstyle, I can't believe it's taken me this many years to work out. 
I used a similar setup on Framing Frame, although messed up stealth on the first attempt. To ensure I didn't have a repeat of that incident on run 2, I just made sure to time my ECMs better, fleeing to day 2 with just the necessary paintings from the gallery. The second day was uneventful, as ever, given I'd maintained stealth, meaning we can just focus on the massive slog that is day 3 of Framing Frame. From the get-go on this one, I was up against it, facing down multiple bulldozers before I'd even located the correct server room. Once inside and the hack is underway, things only get harder. This heist is unique in that basically every cop that spawns in is a sabotage unit from Payday 3. They are all hell-bent on turning off the power from multiple different sources with no concern for self-preservation. Even tankier units will just bulldoze their way to the power supply boxes, often succeeding in disrupting the objective before my army of sentries could take them down. Eventually, I worked out a decent spread of placements to keep the heist under control, but even then, felt like I needed more gun to get this done cleanly. Moving into the final minute of the almost 7 minute long hack, I got myself caught out in the staircase with no sentry cover, tased, disorientated and so nearly put down, which might have been a rage quit moment had this taser not ran up the staircase so quickly to get over to the power boxes. For once, their dedication to disrupting the objective had worked in my favour, and with just about 30 seconds left on the hack, this heist was all but complete, leaving my sentries to keep piling up the bodies in the living room and cover my escape over to the balcony. A nasty heist getting the first time clear treatment is always a great morale booster. From there, I smashed my way through election day one, throwing on purpose to land plan C at the voting centre, admittedly forgetting drill skills which did slow things down, although my sentries had such complete control over the adjacent balcony, the only real risk in this heist, being the constantly spawning sniper waves, were easily dealt with. I was able to gain full access to the vault after about 30 minutes, dispatch of the couple of snipers set up on the opposite rooftops, and escape this heist without much incident. Big Bank next, a real classic but not a tough heist in the grand scheme of things. Stupidly, I managed to handicap myself by bringing along my saw and no ammo bags, meaning I was running on a very limited supply of sentry placements. After taking ages to get the time lock started, the ammo situation was getting even more dire. Fortunately, my jokers were going in extra hard to compensate, sending this cop absolutely cartwheeling over the banister, again reminding me why Payday 2 ragdolls remain undefeated. They followed that feat up shortly after by absolutely annihilating this shield by stuffing their shotgun through its face hole. Truly, a SWAT who was 10 years ahead of its time. Even with their assistance though, by the time the thermite had burned its way into the vault, I was virtually out of saw ammo. With the last few bursts remaining, I was able to secure access to the required cash bags, leaving me without the ability to place any more sentries throughout the rest of the heist. My pistol skills weren't the best, but they were enough to clear a path over to the escape elevator, before flanking around the heist while using my last remaining sentry to hold some cop attention securing the final two required bags thanks to these two kind delivery boys who carried them around for me, enabling a well-timed escape, bearing in mind how quickly I would have been overran at the lifts without any sentries left. This was a huge success, although left me in a slightly awkward position. For the first time in a while, Big Bank had dinged me up to level 80, meaning I had to tackle Hotline Miami on the dreaded Death Wish difficulty, whilst 22 perk points short of my final, highly impactful perk 2. In any case, this was the hand I was dealt, and like this bobblehead bob in the face of adversity, I just had to stand there and pretend it wasn't happening. Sadly, I took Bob's advice far too literally, as I just stood there and pretended that I hadn't just rigged an entire gas station to blow with C4, successfully proving that I am my own worst enemy, even when the actual enemies get stronger. As a wise man once said, you can always tell a Texan, but you can't tell them much. Attempt 2 did show the power boost to the cops had received from progressing to this difficulty though, as this is Madoza managed to steamroll me single-handedly in just 3 shots, punishing me for playing as aggressively as I had previously on Mayhem. Run 3 was much more successful, with me quickly securing access to the basement and starting the search for the Commissar, until I heard a gut-wrenching sound of mangled electronics. Sentry down. Heading topside to mourn the loss of my perfect creation, it was all too much to take in as all that remained was a tripod. Stricken with grief, I managed to catch the exact same heat my poor sentry just had, dropping in a nasty hail of sniper fire alongside it. I still wasn't quite right on the next run, when I managed to run directly into C4 from the wrong side, probably resembling my fallen sentries straight afterwards. Finally, on attempt 5, I pulled it all together, bringing my saw to quickly gain access to the right address barcode, staying inside this time until we had the location, and after being clipped by a dozer on the way back out, I just decided to run for it before the snipers spawned back in, moving us on to the claustrophobic day 2. Deciding I couldn't rely on just a few turrets for this one, I went back to the Frontier Justice, which was huge in holding off at the gate on the way up to the penthouse. 
My first sentry was run over by the newly spawning Minigun Dozer class whilst I placed the Thermal Lance down, although revenge engineering was quickly achieved by its brothers straight after, setting up in the right room to hold down a section of the suite and avoid sniper fire from all angles. This kind of close quarters holdout can get a little crazy at times though, as I didn't have the freedom to move around the entire building because I was using the fire to cover the drill. After being Marshall flashed and resembling Willem Dafoe looking up to the gods, I saw very little of the minigun dozer that was going to town on my small metal army, but heard plenty of noises as my eyeless sentries just kept firing to keep the dozer at bay. It was just about enough to hold as the drill finished up and I charged through the flames to set up a new nest in the Commissar's old panic room, ripping through his health bar with ease before fleeing to the escape without a second thought. Clearly, Deathwish was a manageable difficulty for my sentry squad, and with a full perk deck now backing me up, I was in decent shape to tackle Hotstone Breakout. On attempt 1, I was slightly perplexed. Apparently, they've buffed Ponytail Cop to 480 health, which I was just not prepared for, getting soloed by just her and her Bronco. On attempt 2, I used this revelation to my advantage, converting her to assist me for the rest of the push through the streets of DC. This led to an easy romp through the festively lit exterior portion of the heist before dropping down a sentry to 1v1 a swap van turret. I was confident in my boy, but that confidence was clearly misplaced, as after eating up a fair barrage of rounds initially, it was distracted by a spawning dozer and let its guard down, exploding before I could even react. To make matters worse here, I'd bought the saw for the lockpicking section of this heist in the car park, but failed to consider just how much it hamstrung my build, leaving me with a couple of doors open, but no more sentries and still needing to spend 20 seconds lockpicking to find the control room. Once I actually did find the school dozer occupied room, I had to give him a little Texas line dance to stay alive, not even having the ammo of my pistol to take him on. My fancy feet were just about enough alongside my Joker distractions to get the van moving again, as I was blessed by the most disinterested minigun dozer, who just kind of got bored and wandered off as I removed the armor plating to get driving into day two. The sentry build was basically built with Hotston Breakout Day 2 in mind. You can establish pretty much a complete heist control setup on this one if you place your guns well, although after noticing the cops were just face tanking death in order to get the power off, I realised that going fully auto with my sentries was the way to go for the stun effect when expressly defending objectives, allowing me to basically run freely around the FBI officers, completing Hotston's other tasks whilst the pile stayed untouchable. I did get a little cocky around the 10 minute mark, eating up a few too many rounds from a nearby Skulldozer who dropped me, but this Texan is built to last, with Fain Death now giving me a build a nice extra RNG component if I go down at any time. I was held up again on my way out to the escape, but with enough firepower covering my path back down to the car park, this was another first time clear in the bag. Hotstone Revenge is up next, a fairly simple heist, although you can't really account for a green dozer charging you down with the 1-2 combo of melee for your armor and buckshot for your entire massive health pool in one go. I'll be keeping my distance against these dozers in the future, instead setting up next to the vault with sentries in place to hold off any spawning snipers on the opposing roofs. Unfortunately, I failed to notice a nearby SWAT van turret had a side view on one of my precious guns, leaving it as the fourth to explode on this run. Most of the remaining five took their anger out on poor Hector, who could hardly get a word in as he was flinch-locked to death satisfyingly by a fully auto barrage. All that was left was to secure the police evidence, setting up on the roofs to cover my movements over to the chopper, escaping with six bags and very little interference. Onto the diamond, it was time to bring back that sentry stealth build, failing run one due to bad RNG, and then on run two after I forgot that sentries struggle to outdraw unalerted cops for some reason. Run 3 started much better though, as I successfully hit this civilian by forcing his head into the wall, a classic bit of payday 2 jank. In securing a second keycard for the final time lock, I got into a little trouble with a guard on the staircase, but apparently no one heard him fire and silenced at my sentry as he dropped dead, keeping stealth alive. Whilst this was a slick sentry save, the same can't be said for my overall stealthing abilities, as I got impatient waiting for a decent grid on the tile puzzle and forced things loud. But with four sentry guns still in my back pocket, even in this stealth build, this was far from a panic attack inducing slip. I remained calm, secured the stone, and hid out in the war room where the sentries could easily hold their own, keeping the cops at bay long enough for Bile to arrive and offer up the escape. Hybrid sentry stealth is actually pretty legit, although we can't just stick to conservative strategies, not when Golden Grin is Enchi's dream heist. You see, you can have up to 10 sentries active at once on this one, so of course I had to set it up for him. With this much firepower in the main lobby of the casino, it's easy to see why the cops seem to be keeping their distance, hardly even challenging my mechanical firing squad. Hell, this martial sniper was even hiding in the walls to try and escape my sentry's wrath. 
As a result of this setup, I had complete control over the drilling section of the heist, although Nelly got completely chewed up by a couple of security agents in the control room until I placed down my big bro. That close call was as close as it got, fleeing straight across the casino floor and out to the dispenser filled limousine. Enough excitement for now, I wanted a little more stealth in my life heading next into the bomb dockyard. Sadly, I'm seriously rusty at this heist, failing almost instantly on run 1 and then on run 2 due to a disobedient civilian. Stealth was broken on run 3 after using up one too many pages and once more on run 4 due to this guy developing eyes in the back of his head. I've got way too accustomed to Payday 3's detection system at this point. One more sloppy stealth break later and I finally had a dream stealth section, finding both required keycards early in the east docks before forcing the Moretta to move into position. How exactly this guy, who I dominated about 10 seconds into the heist, wasn't spotted throughout it all, I will never know, but security's lack of perception is my gain, until a civilian of all people rocked up on me right in front of a cam, sending things loud but far enough into the heist that it would be worth proceeding. In fact, I planned for this, bringing the boat escape in pre-planning, meaning I just need to drag the bomb parts over to the side of the dock to secure the escape on this one with little contest from the slow to respond cops. For Scarface Mansion, I'd grab Nimble to halve my lockpicking time and save me from being a slave to the saw. After an initial attempt at killing all the pagerless guards with the turret, I realised stealth might not be the play here, switching back over to the loud build for a proper barn blazer. As an experiment, I set up one sentry to 1v1 Sosa during the assault, but it seems as if he eventually gets bored of combat and repositions, so no early kill cheese, sadly. The exterior section of this heist was a breeze, it was only when I pushed into Scarface Mansion's private lobby that I ran into serious resistance, with one of Sosa's rooftop turrets spawning above my own, giving it instant access to its unguarded weak spot above, ruthlessly one-shotting it. All that did was incur my wrath as I set up another fully auto firing squad to give Sosa hell in his own stolen office, eventually ripping through his massive health pool to move on to the final objective. In an attempt to get control over the spawning sniper population, I tried setting another sentry up on the balcony, but this one was clipped from below, leaving its sad sparking remains in place before I could even pick it back up. Grief struck, this left me two sentries down at a crucial moment, as the four remaining guns did their best to keep the dozer population at bay. They just about had enough to protect me long enough to start moving the loot, setting them up along the path back to the escape boat, each one providing enough cover to keep moving uninterrupted, and complete this heist on the first loud attempt. Crime spree is next, so I paid for the 20 continental coin start and re-rolled into what I thought would be a simple murky station. Hell, I'd already completed this heist at level 0. Unfortunately, being payday 3 brained as I am right now, I got myself caught out early on without the ability to mantle to safety, although I so nearly managed the silent sentry save of a lifetime. There's something kinda sick about being able to answer a pager whilst the sentry covers the killing for any security that might spot you doing the deed coming close to holding things together until this drone ruined the party, being indestructible in Payday 2. Repurching the spree wasn't cheap, meaning attempt 2 had to be success, which it fortunately was, escaping via boat on yet another pacifist run. We'll steer clear of Alesso this time, meaning straight onto counterfeit, stealthing through the early portion to get a head start on the safe pumping. Outside of one close call with a taser, who I managed to finally locate in the shadow of a speedboat and flinch with my final shot, this one really wasn't that hard setting up a perimeter around the valve and keeping the water flowing until I could finally escape to the sewers, easily dispatching of the usually tricky dozer ambush down there. The iconic First World Bank is next up on the classic chopping block. I was easily able to hack and drill my way into the vaults to use the sentry gun's wide net of protection before pushing back out to secure extra thermite. What I have noticed is how much harder it is to forge forward with these setups compared to holding down my position, going down on my way back due to how ill-equipped I was to handle groups alone. Feign Death mercifully brought me back into the game as I flanked around the heist, leaving my jokers to do combat with the angry dozer that had followed me up there. Finally dropping into the vault, the usual deluge of green dozers weren't the issue they normally are, as my sentries held their attention and my shotgun CQB buff Frontier Justice dispensed the DPS necessary to clear them out and start pushing back to the escape. I'd lost a turret in the war on the surface, but had to press forwards, playing as if I had revenge crits to clear out the vault once more as I secured the loot I needed up in the vent. Back on the commercial floor, it seemed as if my jokers had held the minigun dozer's attention the entire time I was downstairs moving loot, meaning I still had to force my way past him with a few well-placed pistol rounds. I was feeling powerful, and this was enough to start rushing through the offices and down the stairs to the car park, where the game had taken to spawning cops out of thin air as the only way to stop me. Still, even when the game was cheating, I had enough rounds left in the tank to survive the ambush and secure the last scraps of loot to make out like a bandit. 
back onto Murky Station for the third time on this run, a record I think, and yet somehow I'm still messing it up. Spotted grabbing this blowtorch from a sieve right in front of the camera, and just unable to secure the final bag before the point of no return hit. There's just something about this heist that doesn't mesh well with Silent Stentry stealth. It's probably the fact that guards actually have sizable health pools. Anyhow, yet again, the way around it was just to go completely unnoticed, sneaking through the second attempt in just under 4 minutes. Onto my main man Jimmy's other heist, whilst I do miss him, I don't miss having to run Boiling Point in Payday 3, as damn, this one always causes some issues. The first time through though, run 1 was going smooth. Too smooth, some might say. Despite most specials increased damage on this heist, grinder and sentries were keeping me topped up, and I didn't suffer from those usual taser one-shots that get me down. For reference, Grinder felt like a great deck for a challenge run. It prevented me from having to go into my crutch first aid kit builds, which was refreshing, and kept me generally healthy and able to think my way out of most situations. However, it doesn't really matter how healthy you are when you're staring down the barrel of several snipers and without the ammunition to even place a sentry to help take some of the heat off you. In the end, impatience got the better of me as I knew I had a messiah charge in my back pocket for a last second revive should I need it. What I didn't expect was to see a 400 pound minigun dozer abseiling down the rock in front of me during the swan song, who forced me to try taking pot shots at heavy units 20 meters away instead, unable to take them down over range before being dropped to the floor for good. Run 2 was not the same walk in the park the first was, which is funnily enough usually a good sign. I had a much tougher scramble on my way down into the lab, and my sentries proved to be great defenders of me, but not that great at defending actual objectives, as the scan was routinely interrupted by Russian SWATs incoming from the second floor. Once I finally had the server in my clutches, I headed back up to start the final charge, steadily dropping another dozer on the staircase before moving out into the open. I'd adapted by bringing ammo instead of two extra guns for this one, meaning I was almost fully loaded as I climbed up to face down the snipers again. I placed a vanguard to take care of the pursuing wave and keep Grinder active, allowing me to face tank most of the snipers before Fain Death proved to once again be the hero of sketchy challenge running, as I was brought back amongst the living with enough fuel to take care of the last few snipers and reach the escape plane, clearing the heist at the second time of asking. Santa's Workshop is a nice reprieve most of the time, at least giving me a laugh early on when I learned that the fleeing sieves on this map seem to get themselves stuck, only to American Psycho walk on the spot until they're put out of their misery. These are the sorts of things that never need updating out of the game. Five minutes later, with all presents made, I decided to go toe to toe with another minigun dozer. Unsurprisingly, I couldn't heal through his damage and then was deprived of my chance to messiah back up again due to how Payday 2 handles solo players. This is something that I would like to see updated, as there's no reason why I shouldn't get 30 full seconds of opportunity to get back on my feet with that skill. Anyway, not the end of the world, Santa's Workshop is at least a short heist, meaning I could instantly head back in for another attempt. In a familiar situation, I kept my distance this time to deal with the dozer, using my sentries to take care of the rooftop snipers whilst I secured the four presents, managing to run straight past a pair of school dozers who were otherwise occupied with my sentries, clearing this heist easily enough. Car shop is a straightforward heist, but sentry stealthing it isn't exactly ideal. After a few tricky RNG scenarios, having to restart three times early on, I was finally able to locate the manager and get the hack going. Unfortunately, I left the office a bit of a mess due to my lack of cable ties, meaning I was forced to drop down an ECM with just 0.2 seconds left on the hack. Fortunately, I was able to place a second jammer down before the alarm went off in the short window I was given, allowing me to rig the pavement to blow and drive straight out of this heist without too much sentry violence necessary. Sadly, we were driving straight towards the biker heist, my least favourite heist in the entire game, and one that has virtually always been a roadblock of some sort on these mercenary runs. Fortunately, NG is built different, as the ability to cover the mechanic's van without putting yourself in danger is huge for the longevity of any potential run. All that was left for me to do was stay safe and move through the objectives as quickly as possible. After delivering the first bike part, I was sent over to find Rush's seat, which was perfectly timed with the end of the first assault wave, meaning all that was left to do was head back to the Overkill Clubhouse to collect the Chrome Skull, a much easier objective than the mechanic escort. One shape charge later, and that was that. I had all I needed to finish up Russ's bike and ride it straight out of there, with my buildings covering the escape for a miracle Lion's Den attempt. So far, NG has absolutely been the strongest TF2 class run, even ahead of the overwhelming power of the heavy. Although, I can't get ahead of myself, and that confidence needs to be kept in check, as on day two, I was hit with an incredible wall of dozers, pinning us in place early on. These guys steamrolled their way through two of my sentries in front of my very eyes, before finally putting me in the dirt as well, as I was quickly surrounded without them. 
Clearly, I couldn't afford to be held in place on this one, so in attempt 2 I simply decided to circumvent all threats, leaving them as a problem for the return journey. Even so, a party of tasers managed to hold me still and wrangle a feign death activation out of me early on, which was at least enough to get me over to the front of the train, injured but still breathing. Here I gave the biker boss another fully auto sentry beatdown, which was damn satisfying, before rushing right back into danger. I was dropped twice, first by a cloaker, with feign death keeping me alive, and then by a few SWATs, who weren't able to finish the job until I'd messiahed my way back to my spurs and able to jag my way back over to the escape, with sentries still holding the cops at bay. Always nice to get that one behind us, but we still have quite a ways to go, and if this failed attempt at panic room that fell to the gangsters is anything to go by, it won't be easy. Once I'd avoided death at the hands of the low lives on run 2, things did get slightly simpler, as soaring the panic room free was never going to be hard for this excellent area control setup. What did surprise me though was how much control I was also able to exert on the roof once the objectives had moved up there. With the right placements, these guns can keep the rooftop almost entirely clear and will take pot shots at the snipers who infamously ended our first ever Payday 2 challenge. What they couldn't do was catch bullets for me, but fortunately even after getting dropped by the snipers I still had Messiah in my back pocket to stand back up and fight. This might just be the most authentic NG gameplay you'll see all day, camping on the control point as the enemies keep throwing themselves at me instead of just switching to a direct hit to clear out the real problems, my buildings. Anyway, for those few cops my turrets weren't cutting down, I still had a perfectly capable shotgun equipped for me to pick off what was left. The satisfaction of ragdolling swats straight off the side of the building is difficult to replicate. Even so, I can't believe the control I had on this heist wasn't enough for Bile to hurry up and land sooner. This one feels far too scripted to make you wait to the end of waves on harder difficulties. Outside of a bit of a scare up against a minigun dozer, this extended exposure wasn't an issue though, as the ammo economy was completely sustainable, allowing me to leave the rooftop far more colourful than when I arrived, escaping down the sewers for a smooth first time victory. With over 500 kills in just over 20 minutes, that might have been the highest kill per minute heist this series has ever seen. Historians, let me know. Brooklyn 1010 is another sniper filled adventure, with my sentries refusing to fire down at the gangsters below, meaning I actually needed to do something myself for once. On the way over to the second building, I was actually ambushed by a cloaker at the door, something I have never seen happen before as it's almost always set to be a school dozer. Not complaining though, as this gave me an uncontested path into the second holdout. I wasn't in a great ammo situation here until I could get the first lock gate open, meaning I just had to rely on my pre-placed guns to retain the enemy's attention. There were a few close calls, but the sentries carried hard again as I just flanked around taking pot shots at the snipers until it was time to head down to the road level. Here in my infinite wisdom I attempted to lockpick into my usual holdout room on this heist by using sentries to tank the aggro of the SWAT turret. In a display of total dominance, it took down both of my distractions and me, needing feign death to keep fighting. Rushing away from this deadly obstacle, I was left with no visible health at the escape and had lost most of my ammo to the destroyed sentries, attempting to hold out behind the last gun I could actually place before receiving the blessing of the auto-revive and later managing to messiah myself back from a lucky sniper kill. But after all that favourable RNG, I still hadn't learned my lesson, face tanking another dozer who dropped me, only to roll yet another 45% chance skill activation. At this point, I was straight up out of downs, having been self-revived so many times consecutively, so I'm now wondering what the karmic consequences of getting this lucky actually are. I'll probably just stay inside for the next few days, as against all odds and probabilities, I made it to the escape van on the first attempt. Maybe facing down a stealth-only heist like the Yacht Heist, which is up next, is just punishment for that outrageous luck. Or so I initially thought. What this actually turned into was a mad showcase for the viability of this wacky silent sentry playstyle. After dominating one guard in an unpatrolled side room, I headed up to the deck, getting spotted early on and being forced to again dominate the security and leave him in a highly trafficked location. After dropping an ECM jammer to reach the first guard that spotted him, I was surprised by another guard down the corridor, although he mercifully hadn't seen me, only the body, meaning he was more than happy to go investigate the business end of another sentry gun, using up my final pager, but clearing most guards out of this area of the map. Incredibly, I was able to move fast enough through the rest of the heist to secure the final money bundles, head down to the control room and overheat the servers to grab the loose hard drive, first timing the heist from what looked to be a completely failed state. Undercover isn't that bad of a heist when your build is both excellent at close quarters and can take care of snipers in a pinch. After sending this taser to the Shadow Realm, I set up on the rooftop where the limo texture doesn't seem to be quite right. Not a massive worry though, as I have excellent control up here, with my sentries keeping most ground cops at bay whilst I showcase my cross-map shotgunning skills. 
I'm not sure they implemented damage drop off on this bad boy, which I'm all here for. This set us up to easily escort the taxman down to his lovely whacking station off Assault, where I went to town with my wrench to engineer him a new face. The taxman's room is completely locked down, but I did have to go on occasional missions to keep the power running on the upper floors. After walking in on the aftermath of a Sentry vs Minigun Dozer 1v1, I avenged my ammoless gun, which had lost the war of attrition, and returned to the basement for the final stretch of the hack. Again, hold out heist of this build's bread and butter, meaning a clean getaway was all but ensured at this point. Slaughterhouse can be a nuisance, again, lacking a way to effectively move 8 bags of gold can suck, but it's also a heist that can be massively aided by sentry guns, which control the pace and enemy prioritisation and all the key moments in this heist. Unfortunately, after all the recent success, I've become incredibly overconfident in my playstyle. So cocky in fact that I just couldn't imagine a world where fame death didn't proc on my command. See, after this green dozer meat shot me for an instant kill, of course I stood right back up again, and hell, it didn't even matter I was flashbanged, I could afford to go down again as my sentries would hold his attention as soon as he dropped me, and I could still messiah my way back into the game. Calculated risks, I thought as I got nailed by about 5 sniper rounds at once, unfazed of course I'd be back on my feet in just a second. But eventually, that sort of consistent insane luck has to run out and the later it does so, the more it stings. As deep into the final escape section of the heist, even after surviving the Dozer ambush, I failed to notice the pair of snipers who just spawned in overlooking the final crate. This time, when I went down, I didn't stand up, receiving a gut punch of 24 wasted minutes. Honestly, that was just the humbling I needed though, as on attempt 2 I actually considered my strategy, moving 7 of the gold bags together under sentry cover before heading back for number 8 alongside the second gas tank I needed, instead of getting pinned down in the yard. Then, one innocent and amorous sentry was destroyed by a few careless dozer shots, infuriating me into action. Whilst I was grateful for another feign death activation, as this dozer came out of seemingly nowhere to run me through instantly, this time I didn't let it go to waste. Moving my remaining forces into a dust bowl of containers, they proved the old adage of if you build it, they will come, and in this case, coming is synonymous for dying, as dozer after dozer hit the ground at the hands of my automated firing squad. This was a simple holdout until the escape opened, where instead of dallying and dealing with the fixed spawns, I just rushed through to the final container before they had a chance to set up, completing another lifeline stealing heist in the past. Moving on to Beneath the Mountain, on attempt 1, I was absolutely destroyed without recourse by a Skulldozer at the airlock who was just out of range of my turret. This is a harsh reminder of how underpowered this run would be without the sentries. But fortunately, it also showcases the madness of Payday 2's randomization, when on run 2, there was just a lone sniper in his place. This kind of RNG can't be replicated in Payday 3, and I think it's kinda killing the game's replayability, as this run felt completely different compared to the last one. Anyway, customary Payday 3 backhander out of the way, once I was actually in the control center, the loot secure was all but guaranteed, with the entire area under sentry protection. Up on the top side of this heist, things did get a little messy, as I went down at the hands of a surprise dozer ambush, before being forced to break the Geneva Convention personally for this Messiah revive. At least my sentries and I are now guilty of equivalent crimes. Up on the helipad, I played the role of spot of my turrets, leading to an uncontested escape in a refueled chopper. Birth of Sky can be a tricky follow-up, although the first 5 minutes are always deceptively easy. I rushed the first pallet by landing in on the roof of the hardware store, and was able to locate and reattach the loose money bags quickly for bundle 2, before anything particularly dangerous spawned in. With my sentries covering the killing, it was easy to stay on top of the objectives as the third pallet turned into a controlled gas station holdout, done before snipers could even start spawning in. Without wanting to see how another sentry vs SWAT turret 1v1 would end, I quickly sprinted down to the sewers, where the usual madness ensued. What makes the Birth of Sky Tunnel so difficult usually, is that all cop attention is focused on the heister immediately. But with sentries at my side, their attention is automatically divided, meaning I was easily able to force my way through the two sewer gates quickly, before the endless spawns started to overwhelm us, leading to another straightforward completion. The first corner of Heat Street is anything but straightforward in comparison. On my first attempt I was down once before even turning it, a second time once I had, and then I was hit by a firing squad of Skulldozers who spawned far too early for my liking. When we compare it to attempt 2, we see how RNG truly dictates Payday 2's ability to ruin your day at the drop of a hat, when the street was all but empty up until Matt's car crash. This holdout is ideal for our build, as it is in the actual holdout mode, but the escort section does throw up a nasty curveball as I always have to keep doubling back for the turrets I leave behind, slowing down Matt's progress up the alleyways. Still, I've got pretty damn good at aggro juggling with sentries, holding the SWAT turret's attention for long enough to squeeze past before pushing up the hill to tackle a couple of minigun dozers who are waiting right at the turn to the main road. 
If we could survive that kind of heat without losing a gun, we could probably survive anything, including the swap van that spawned in at the top of the escape zone, which wasn't ideal, but thanks to this brave sentry tanking it up with its shields, we had long enough to drag Matt over to the final escape. Similar to Heat Street, Green Bridge loves throwing an army of tricky glass cannon beat cops at you as soon as the heist begins. And as we know, this build isn't great against a high volume of ultra powerful cops. Fortunately, Feign Death saved the day once more, allowing me to fully auto most of them down with my sentries and start soaring into the vans. The Mark was up in the first group of three, which is ideal as he popped out right as the assault ended, and I was able to escort him up to the scaffolding without any incidents. After heading back to pick up my Vanguard sentries, I set up for a complete domination of the scaffolding rooftop holdout. Even whilst being able to match the SWAT's firepower, things still got a little messy, with snipers, helicopter turrets, and a pair of dozers doing everything in their power to put me and my little metal battalion out of action, but all of whom were repelled or left in the dirt. The prisoner pickup was successful on its first flyover, meaning all that was left was an escape up against a set of school dozers further down the bridge. I had the speed to avoid most of the chopper turret fire, meaning once my sentry placements had baited the dozers over to the opposite end of the escape, I simply had to sprint around them to ensure my victory without needing to actually engage in combat. Just a couple of XP points away from level 100, this run was on the verge of hitting critical mass. That in mind, Alaskan Deal was never going to pose much of a threat, with my sentries taking complete control over the oil pumps to get the boat moving quickly, before my luckily timed rush to the ship allowed us to cast off completely uncontested. The classic Diamond Heist was a perfect candidate for more of my hybrid stealthing escapades. Sometimes you just need a little less gun, although getting caught this early into Attempt 1 didn't seem worthwhile, encouraging an early restart. Attempt 2 was much more of a success from the off, as I dominated the camera guard and headed over to start the security hack. This area of the heist was densely populated by guards, but my detection risk on this bill was now low enough to squeeze between them and allow me to reach the vault without incident. I was blessed by the nearest escape location, meaning even though I had the tools to go loud at this point, it was still quicker to attempt to finish this in stealth, rushing the 8 bags over to the window cleaning platform to complete this heist silently under the cover of an ECM. This success gives me a little bit of hope for that dreaded Breaking Feds experience to come. Having just graduated to max level, this is the final loud build that I'll be running through most of the heist moving forwards, a truly complete sentry focused build with enough utility and survivability to stay afloat within this challenge run format. Heading onto Reservoir Dog's first section, this build was more than enough to blast through without any scrapes at all. The prequel days, ironically, where most things usually go wrong. Although it's not usual things go wrong before a single shot has been fired, with Mr. Brown refusing to enter the store, evidently getting a premonition of what was to come. He was more willing on attempt two, although that hardly guaranteed victory, seeing as I was absolutely decimated sprinting across the LA streets for the liquid nitrogen without any sentry cover. Run 3 went much further, but I still hadn't properly learned my lesson, running out in the open to recover the diamonds that were being stolen back, eating a lethal snipe around and going down completely before I got a chance to redeem myself with Messiah. Heading into attempt 4, once again Mr. Brown didn't fancy it, but after a bit of cajoling, he went in and took his customary bullet through the cranium to unleash the madness of the initial ambush. After holding that off, I was well placed to start moving through the other objectives and righting the wrongs of my failed runs. This started by me establishing more sentry presence alongside the road, offering me more cover when I headed out to start moving the diamonds into Mr. Blonde's car. Out on the hectic tarmac, we eventually worked our way through a minigun doser's health pool, as one brave sentry fell, taking all the aggro from the SWAT turret. But the sacrifice wasn't in vain, as it had earned me the time I needed to secure the sixth and final necessary bag, sprinting past the blockade and into the final alleyway for escape. Onto the home straight now, it's Brooklyn Bank next, a heist that offers a bit of an initial scramble, with Messiah required after a green dozer completely one-shot me. This slight road bump wouldn't be repeated, as I rolled into the most forgiving RNG this heist has to offer, drilling into the vault seamlessly. The NG's aura was starting to get too powerful for most at this point, with medics straight up teleporting back to spawn rather than face me in battle. Once I had my hands on the medallion, all I needed to do was sprint to the escape van for another notch on my belt. Regardless of my confidence on this run, breaking feds is always a great leveler. Buckle up for this one. On run 1, I flew too close to the sun, being spotted by Garrett himself whilst trying to lure him out. On run 2, I walked up to the first security guard I spotted and just handed myself in. Run 3 saw Garrett make it back to his office before I was able to get out, meaning even though I'd guessed his safe code correctly first time, it was all for naught. Run 4 was a carbon copy of run 2, whilst 5 ended with a dreadful error after I was spotted leaving with the coffer, and my sentry couldn't land the high saving shot whilst answering that pager. I almost saved run 6 with a tricky little sentry takedown, but Garrett came upon the scene before I could tidy it up. Run 7 ended in blood after my sentry suddenly turned into John Wick when dropping its targets, leading to more pages than I could answer at once, whilst 8's premature ending was completely my fault when I wandered unprovoked into an unsuspecting Garrett myself. 9 was another sentry gun bloodbath, 10 was failed to a camera slip up, and 11 to a miss pager. 
12 was true torture after I got myself spotted right in front of the evidence room as I grabbed the box, resulting in a hopeful ECM scramble down in the elevator, which culminated in the heist ending right as Twitch blew the downstairs wall open. 13 didn't even get close to an escape, needing to be restarted as soon as Garrett was drawn out right in front of a dominated guard, but finally, attempt 14 showed a little bit of promise. Once I'd taken down cams, I lured Garrett out, receiving the historic clue from Locke, meaning I had my hands on the coffer securely at last. Upon reaching the FBI office area again, I dropped a jammer and a sentry to confirm that I'd be free to leave after an hour of pure, upsetting repetition, with hardly a sentry beep to be heard. On the plus side, Henry's Rock is a true testing ground for the quality of this run's build. A return to full-time engineering. This is a brutal, sprawling maze of tricky objectives and challenging spawn logic, with run 1 coming to a sticky end when a shield marshal managed to flash me out in the open, blinding me through my messiah period, meaning I never had a chance to get back on my feet. An honourable death, but it's fair to say a real Texan would have dodged my next failure, as I wandered into the very laser beam I just fired myself without a care in the world, assumedly melting upon contact. Run 3 was at least devoid of any self-sabotage of that level, however it wasn't without its ups and downs. Almost instantly during the initial override, I was swatted to the floor, needing feign death to pick me up again, procking once more several minutes later when I forgot that Payday 2 snipers can double shot you without needing to reset between firing. I have to admit, my good fortune on this run has been off the charts, but having access to those revenant skills has been predominantly facilitated by the sheer power of the sentry tree, needing very little else for aggression. I finally had the opportunity to achieve a lifetime goal of stacking a level 2 sentry on top of a level 1 in the weapons lab, although its life was sadly short-lived from this elevated position. Moving out, having secured the two coffers, this time I remember to use my own dispenser to reset those downs, although it didn't end up being necessary, after I stayed on my feet this time by setting up a protective sentry nest to keep me alive even when flashed into oblivion by a marshal, just like how attempt 1 was cut short. I was brought down to just a grazing shot from death, but able to survive and resustain up with Grinder, just in time for the escape to arrive and clear off from one of this challenge's final major hurdles. Shacklethorn Auction is usually a breeze at this stage of the game, as I headed back over to my stealth build once more to easily fly through stealth up to the Auctioneer's objective, at which point I just switched tactics over to Loud to speed up the entire process. Within minutes, I was ready to head into the vault, repelling all comers with just three sentries at the entrance, easily gaining access to the obsidian plate. Off to prison, not for the first time in 2023, Hell's Island is always a madhouse with virtually no objectives other than shoot the murkies. Perfect for my build, or so I thought, until I noticed it seemed to take an age to actually get through the initial ambush. Doing so requires kills, but it seems to expressly require kills earned from my weapons, which became an even more acute problem during the endless assault, with my sentries being necessary to keep me alive, but also stealing my potential progression, slowing down Lot's journey through the area to such an extent that as I finally reached the last hack, which takes a minute, I had around 55 seconds left on the heist clock, forcing an immediate restart. Attempt 2 didn't get off to a great start, after I was forced into another feign death situation early on by a murky schooldozer. Not much happened between that scare and the most important section of the heist though, once over the bridge, fighting to move Locke along as quickly as possible. This time I changed up the strategy, going full battle NG, sadly without a gunslinger and a set of pesky mini sentries, instead having to rely on my Gruber to pick up the required kills quite quickly, before being bullied to the ground and saved once again by feign death. This left me ample time to gain access to the helipad, although I still nearly threw this one when a taser held me in place for every merc in the vicinity to wail on, just about securing the revive via Messiah this time, milliseconds before I was completely incapacitated by an incoming melee swing. Sprinting back up to the chopper, with lock arriving with 15 seconds remaining, this was not a clean victory, but an impactful one all the same, with no mercy next, hardly requiring me to pay attention. In fact, I might have been a little too disinterested in how this one went, as I hardly even noticed this massive lag explosion, assumedly caused by an attempted breach and the sheer number of bodies around my ankles. I was so laissez-faire I ended up somehow allowing myself to go down whilst waiting for the elevator, hardly watching my screen as I lost my entire health pool just out of frame, failing this heist somehow after 20 wasted minutes. Not wanting to waste any more time, this here challenge run ain't getting any shorter, I actually focused up on the second run, allowing my sentries to go to town on every spawning cop until one of the six was taken down, at which point I moved deeper into the hospital ward to stay better protected from all sides. Over 400 kills later, the hospital resembled more of a colourful morgue, and I was in position to escape this heist straight from the rooftop. That brings us on to the final frontier of any Payday 2 challenge run, the White House. I've been a little ashamed of myself for just stealthing this one recently, so with one of the strongest builds I suspect I will ever have access to in this format, I want to go out with at least somewhat of a bang, although not before a little good old fashioned cloak and dagger first. Attempt 1 was abandoned after being spotted in stealth before even making it over to the West Wing, resetting and quickly making it over to the Oval Office on the second attempt. 
Unfortunately, I dominated the camera guard in the most obvious location possible, but left him with a sentry for company. This bait worked like a charm initially, as both guards who spotted him were taken out with staggered pages, just in time for me to answer them, until the fourth guard in the area happened upon this strange scene and thought the most sensible thing he could do was cuff me, ending the heist immediately. On attempt 3 I went one step further, successfully gunning down the main Oval Office guards with my sentries and dominating the other two, allowing me to make it down to the Peoc without breaking stealth. Here I went loud, expecting to be able to hold out as I had so many times earlier in the run, but alas I was ambushed out of nowhere by a dozer who one shot me before he even knew what he was shooting at. This tempted me to try the heist entirely on loud, although an early crash had me rethinking that plan as I couldn't handle the heartache of technical difficulties this far into a challenge. I clumsily walked into the first guard I could on run 5, leading us into run 6, another where I finally managed to enter the west wing and proceed with stealth. Here I wandered into the first guard I could, dominating him, before doing the exact same thing to another patrolling guard a couple of minutes later. With these two in a prime position to be spotted by any other moving security, I simply had to run, locating the safe code just in time to sprint over to the Piot's hidden airlock and find my way inside, despawning the regular White House guards just in time to hold things together. This meant I could get the vault mainframe hack started before going loud, eventually sounding the alarm after I already set up the second hack. This meant I could hold down the Peoc with three separate sentry nests, two defending the PC, two on the power switch and two for me next to the secret painting to hide behind if things got a little crazy. They quickly did as a pair of dozers flooded in from the far end of the room, but my nest over there held strong, keeping them at bay long enough to complete hack number two. After that I was lucky enough to roll the tear glass RNG into the roof turrets, as we already know they can hit over my sentry's shield blind spots. This meant that I could keep my sentries alive and fuel with ammo long enough to open the vault and start grabbing the pardons. Fleeing the Peoc after recovering all six of my little mechanical children before setting them back up at the White House entrance to cover my hack of the anti-air controls. In the scuffle I managed to attach this guy to a door, wrench his mate over here into a shallow grave and grab a few more satisfying shotgun kills to bring up the end of this Texan adventure, jumping straight into Lot's chopper to complete the heist and finish this run. While sentry guns might be a little bit too strong on Deathwish and below, this is the first challenge run I've finished and thought, damn, I probably shouldn't have allowed myself access to jokers because with a potential 8 distractions out at any point in a heist, you can see how I got away with so much and secured so many first time clears. It's also impossible to ignore the sheer amount of faint death luck I seem to experience on this one. Hands up, that was pure good fortune. It wasn't without its trials and tribulations though, and whilst I had fun with Silent Sentry Stealth, I'm not sure I've discovered a new meta. I also want to commemorate the 14 sentries that failed to make it to the end, sacrificing themselves at some point in this run. It's on the shoulders of their tiny little tripods that this run's success was guaranteed. I'd like to say we got that done faster than a knife fight in a phone booth, but in all honesty, this was my most dedicated and detailed script ever, so if you enjoyed, let me know. Thank you so much for watching this video to the end. I hope everyone has had and is still having, depending on when this one goes up, a great holiday period. If you're looking to splash out on a new Apex gaming PC with that Christmas money, look no further than my range from the guys over at Apex, and do me a massive favour, if you've enjoyed, head over to the new Yellwant channel, link below, and in the pinned comment. There I've just uploaded the complete interview I did with Payday 3's new game director Mio earlier in December and plan on releasing more long form and challenge run content in the future if you're interested. Take care, happy new year, I hope it's a great one for all of us. A huge thank you to my dedicated Patreon backers. If you want to join this crew in Going Infamous, check out the link below and pledge as little as $2 to see your name in the credits or get 24 hour early access to future videos and vote on upcoming content. Take care, I'll see you all soon.